All right, everybody, let's get started this morning. Thank you for being here this morning at First Baptist Church. We're so excited to see your smiling, wonderful, beautiful faces today. Today was our launch of our Sunday school back up, and so I, I, I kind of tried to make my rounds this morning to check on each of the classes, and I didn't make it up to a few, but I was excited to see some, some life down the hallways. It's been uh, kind of sad over the last few months not having, not having Sunday school, and so I'm so glad to see you all today. Uh, thank you for joining us online. Those of you who are on YouTube and Facebook, we're so excited that our church is gathering both both in person and online. It's a wonderful time to worship the Lord. It's a beautiful day today. Let me go to the Lord in prayer this morning, and then we'll be ready to get into some worship and, uh, and, and to study God's Word this morning. Why don't you pray with me? Father, I love you, Lord, and I'm so grateful for this day that you've given us. This is the day that you've made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. We will praise your name, Lord Jesus, because you are worthy of it and more. Thank you for this opportunity we have to gather as your body. I pray that today you would move among us, that you would instruct us through your word, that the Holy Spirit would teach us. And I pray among all things, Lord, that your name would be glorified. We're not here for me. We're not here for anyone else. We are here to glorify the name of Jesus. Our, our knees bow and our tongues confess that you are Lord to the glory of God the Father. I thank you, Lord, for who you are, what you did for us on the cross. And I pray that today would be a day that we would lift you high. In your name, we ask these things. Amen. Church, why don't we stand together? Amen. Stand with us as we uh, sing this morning. I wanted to share this statement with you and about how these songs were picked for today. Uh, one of the statements I remember Mark making about this message is we are created and saved to be a blessing to others. All of these songs are about our, our, us being witnesses, uh, sharing our testimony, and our love for God. That is being a blessing to others as we share and uh, sing together. Let's, let's remember those things uh, as we sing today. Sing. What a wonderful change in my life.
So we've been talking through a series over the last few weeks about some of the characters in the Bible that aren't so familiar. They're not, they're not as well known. They're a little bit more obscure. And we're going to continue that theme today. We, we've talked about some of the different characters like Deborah and Elisha. And then last week, uh, our, our new family pastor, Thomas, preached on the character of the truly bizarre story of Ezekiel. And this week and for the next few, we're going to be actually migrating into the New Testament. So um, we're going to be in the book of Acts for the next few weeks. So if you grab your Bibles and go with me to Acts chapter 9, I would really appreciate it. So I'm going to tell you a, a little story before we get started about something that happened this, this week, or actually yesterday. I went to Dollar General and I was wearing my mask. And I looked and I kept, you know how you, when you're walking down the aisles, you keep running into the same person. It almost looks like you're, you're following them, even though you're really not. You just keep running into them. And I realized about halfway through seeing this person over and over that they were one of our church members. So, but really when you're, when you're wearing the mask, you can't, you, you're only seeing this much. You can only see based on eyes. So I determined the next time I saw her, I would, I would stop and, and say hi. I didn't want to be that guy who just walks by. And so the next time I saw her down the aisle and I marched right down that aisle and I said, hey, how are you doing? And she looked at me and she said, do I know you? <laughs> and I sat there and I realized that was not one of our church members. It was just some random person. And nobody, even in a regular time, nobody wants a strange man approaching them very confidently. And then especially during this time when everybody's trying to stay separated and stay isolated, somebody walking up to you like that just doesn't seem the big thing. But the thing is, it was somebody I thought I knew, but as I looked more in depth and I realized it was somebody I had no idea who it was, did not make a great contact for the church. Um, just, it, it didn't matter, the next, my next line being, I'm the pastor at First Baptist, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter that. But here's the thing, in scripture we know these characters, we know some of the, the big names. When I say, who is David, or who is Moses, or who is Jonah, we, we know that all the, the facts come to our head, we know all these different things. But then we look at some of these characters in scripture, and you're kind of looking at them and kind of mask, you're thinking, I think... Maybe I've heard of that person. I'm, I'm not positive. So what I want to do in this series is I want to highlight some of these figures in Scripture who have a story to tell, a beautiful story to tell. And so this morning we're going to look at the story of Tabitha and the life-giving prayer in Acts chapter 9. So go with me to Acts chapter 9. So I, this story has been rooted in my heart ever since the beginning of, of when I started thinking and praying about this series. It's been, I've been meditating on it, I've been chewing on it, I've been thinking about this. This was one of the key Bible passages that I wanted to study as we walked through this series called The Stories They Never Told You Before. So let's open it up to Acts chapter 9, and we're going to start in verse 36. Acts chapter 9. And we're going to be in verse 36, and we're going to read to the end of the chapter. If you have it, I'm going to ask you to stand with me, if you would, to give honor to the reading of God's Word. Acts chapter 9, verse 36. Everybody there say amen? You got it. All right. In Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha, which is translated Dorcas. She, she was always doing good works and acts of charity. And about that time, she became sick and died. And after washing her, they placed her in a room upstairs. Since Luda was near Joppa, the disciples heard that Peter was there. We know Peter. Peter was there, and they sent men, two men to him to, who urged him, Don't delay in coming with us. So Peter got up and went with them. And when he arrived, they led him to the room upstairs. And all the widows approached him, weeping and showing him the robes and clothes that Dorcas had made while she was with them. So Peter sent them all out of the room. He knelt down, he prayed, and turning toward the body, said, Tabitha, get up. And she opened her eyes, saw Peter, and sat up. He gave her his hand and helped her to stand up. He called the saints and the widows and presented her alive. And this became known throughout Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. And Peter stayed there for some time in Joppa with Simon, a leather team. Okay, let's, we're going to dive into this. We're going to open this up. You guys can be seated. Thank you, Nate. You, you, you set the standard, man. You sit, and I'll let everybody else sit. We'll just look for that. Let me pray for us, and then, and then we'll kind of unpack this this week. 
Father, I love you, Lord. I'm, I'm grateful for this opportunity. Thank you for Tabitha. Thank you for her gentle, sweet heart. Thank you, Lord, that, that she was selfless, that she sacrificed so much for other people who had a heart of compassion. Lord, I pray that we would be people like Tabitha. It's what our nation needs. It's what our church needs. And I pray that we would emulate her, her story today. Thank you, Father, for what you do for us, how you bless us, how you've given us more than we ever thought to, to ask for or even imagine. We're so blessed. And so we want to be a blessing back to you today, Lord, through praise, through giving, through serving, through loving, through fellowship. Father, I love you and I, and I give you this time. I dedicate it to you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. In your name, amen. So look at this. Let's, let's talk about this, this character of Tabitha. Has anybody heard this story before? A few people? Maybe? Nobody? A couple people? Hey, we got a few. You Bible scholars out there. Most of us don't. And, and this is a story that I, I'm, I'm, I'm sad that we don't know more about. But why is she such an obscure character? When you look at chapter 9 of the book of Acts, what dominates that chapter? What's the first thing that you see at the beginning of chapter 9? Let's do some research. Let's look at context. Somebody comes to faith in Christ. Saul. Okay, so three-fourths of this chapter is dominated by this incredible moment when a man named Saul who was persecuting the church, who was headed to put more Christians in prison, all of a sudden meets Jesus on the road to Damascus, comes to faith in Christ, is baptized, becomes a teacher, and starts to transform the landscape of Christianity in this time. So that's what, that's what kind of takes up the book, or the, the chap, this chapter of Acts. Then hidden in the corner is this little story of this woman named Tabitha. She, she doesn't have a lot of coloring pages that we could download for her. Cindy had to look really, really deep to find one coloring page uh, for, for Tabitha. She doesn't get the VeggieTales movies. She, she, doesn't, she doesn't get the sermon series. She doesn't get those things because they, they all go to Paul, and, and rightly so, because his, his transformation here in Acts chapter 9 really is going to be what transforms the rest of the New Testament. He's going to write the majority of it. But you see this woman named Tabitha, and I'm going to argue this morning for her case that in the kingdom of God, her story is just as important as the Apostle Paul's story. And you know what? Your story in the kingdom of God is just as important. God uses people who you look at and you think, there's no way. There's no way they're going to make any difference. I've got to tell you, as a, as a student pastor, I love all the students that I've ever worked with. I have to say that. I've got to kind of throw that out there. I love every one of them. There were some of them, though, that you would look at and say, that person's going to do something big. And then there were some that you'd say, they're there. <laughs> and what happened in the economy of God's kingdom, looking back on it now, the ones that I said, oh man, they're going to do such great things, they may not even be in church today. And the ones that I looked at, I thought, okay, they're there. They're the ones that are being missionaries right now. They're the ones that are, that are being youth pastors. They're the ones that are transforming their community. It's crazy when you look at this. God can use anybody. And so you look at this woman, Tabitha, and she didn't amount to much. She was one person in a tiny, insignificant port town. She didn't, she didn't matter. She didn't write any books of the Bible. She didn't lead any famous people to the Lord. She didn't transform the, the whole face of Christianity. She was just faithful and sacrificial. And she walked with Jesus. So she doesn't get the VeggieTales story, but we're going we're gonna to talk about her today. We're going to celebrate her story today. The woman had two names. I'm going to focus in on Tabitha, because I really, I, I can't say the other name repeatedly. The name Dorcas. My brothers called me that growing up. <laughs> so that's a name. I'm going to stick with Tabitha, but she has two names, and that's not just the detail here. That, that's not just an unimportant kind of thing as we pass through. It's a very important crucial aspect to her character. We're going to see it at the end of this story. But she lived on the border between Jewish and Gentile cultures. She was a bridge between those two worlds. And we're going to look at what that means. Both of these names mean the same thing. They mean gazelle. That's, that's what the name Tabitha and the name Dorcas means. And I love what R. Kent Hughes said about her. He said, her personality fit her name as she was lovely and graceful. Isn't that nice? Let's talk about Tabitha this morning. Number one, look at the first thing. What's the first thing that you learn about her here in Acts chapter 9, verse 36? In Joppa, there was what? There was a disciple. In Joppa, there was a disciple. The first thing we learn about this woman is that she was a disciple. Now think about how you introduce yourself 
today in, in, your, in your daily life? How, how, just give me an example. How do you, how do you introduce yourself? Mark, I'm meeting you for the first time. What would you say? Your name is Mark. Good. Okay. First thing is your name. Obviously, because I need to know. Have you ever had that be a, a situation where you talk to someone and they don't tell you what their name is? And you're like, I know so much about you and I don't even know who you are. That's what happens in church quite a bit when a new pastor comes. It, it takes a long time to learn people's names. All right, don't quiz me. It, it, it takes a while. But listen, that's the first thing. Typically, I'll go up to a person and I'll be like, hi, my name is Mark. I'm the pastor at First Baptist. But listen, that's what I do. That's not who I am. I'm going to ask you a question this morning. What defines you? What's the most important characteristic about you? What's the first thing that you want people to know about who you are? Not about what you do, but about who you are. Because look at Tabitha. Her identity was rooted in Christ. Her, her whole identity, the first thing she wanted people to know about her, the first thing that people noticed about her is that there was a disciple named Tabitha. Her relationship with Christ was so vibrant, it was so visible that people looked and said, I know Tabitha, but I know her first as a disciple. Look at, look at what she does. She's, she's a disciple first and foremost. That word disciple, this is the only time in the New Testament it shows up in this female version. It's the only time it shows up the female version of disciple. Now that doesn't mean that there weren't more female disciples. But this is unique to her. This is, this is what defined her. Her identity was rooted in her discipleship. If our relationship with Jesus is not what defines us, then we're rooting ourselves in the wrong identity. Amen. If we can go through a conversation and we can meet new people and we can exist with them for months and months and months and then they find out that you're a believer, We've missed something here. It should define us. Now, I'm not saying that I should go up to every person and be like, Hi, I'm a believer in Jesus Christ and my name is Mark. Okay, so that may, that may be a little weird. It may be a little off-putting to, to a lot of people. That's probably a very quick way to shut off a lot of conversations with people. But what should define us? They should look at you when they meet you and say, There's something about them. Man, there's something about that person. They're different. They, they don't just act like everyone else. They're not like everybody else in the city of Joppa. She's unique. She's, she's Tabitha. I know her. She's the disciple. In Joppa, there was a disciple. Her whole identity is rooted in Christ and her relationship with Jesus. Let's keep going. So she had an identity rooted in, in Christ. I know your, your bulletin notes. I, I forgot the word rooted. So you're going to have to fit identity and rooted in that, in that very tiny little blank. Good luck with that. But she had an identity rooted in Christ. And this is where we learn what she did. She had a heart overflowing with compassion. She had a heart overflowing with compassion. In Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha, which is translated Dorcas. She was always doing what? Good works and acts of charity. She was always. You know what that word always means? It means always. <laughs> it means always. It means that was her life's goal. It was her life's ambition. What she dedicated herself to was good works and acts of charity. Listen, here's the thing. I think what's happened in our country is that we've gotten these two things backwards. Both of these things are fantastic. A relationship with Christ is, is central. And doing good works and acts of charity, they, that's, that's got to be an important part of our life as believers. But the problem is when you get them backwards, then the whole alignment is, is out, of, out of alignment. Because what we want to do is, is we want to be social justice warriors. We want to go and we want to, we want to be a blessing to everybody. We want to do all these things. But instead what happens is that our identity gets rooted in that rather than the fact that we're disciples. And so you see the correct order here. She had a relationship with Christ. She had an identity rooted in Jesus. And out of the overflow of that relationship, she was blessing others. Anything else is, is out of alignment. It's out of order. And so we see here what she was doing. She was always doing good work. That word good, I love it. It shows up so often in the New Testament. About 128 times the word good shows up in context of good works. And this is one of my favorites. I think this describes Tabitha really well. It says in, in verse, uh, Matthew chapter 7, verse 18, A good tree can't produce bad fruit. Neither can a bad tree produce good fruit. So that's, that's the life of Tabitha. She is rooted in Christ, and she is being a blessing 
to the people around her. We're actually going to read here in a few verses about what she's doing to be a blessing to others. But that's, she had an identity that was rooted in Jesus. She had a heart that was overflowing with compassion. Can you imagine, church? Just for a second, walk with me. Let's go to pretend world. Can you imagine every one of, of us sitting in this room today? I'll throw us under the bus. If we came to this place with the motivation that it's not about me. It's not about me. It's about someone else. What if we walked out into our daily lives and it wasn't about our comfort and it wasn't about our preferences and it wasn't about people offending me and it wasn't about the things that people have done to me, but I look and I say, you know what? My life is going to be about someone else. It's going to be about blessing someone else. It's going to be about loving someone else. It's going to be about the overflow of a heart of compassion to other people. Can you imagine what would change in our culture? Because I think where we are as a nation, I'm being straight up with you, I think where we are as a nation is because we are self-obsessed. I think this is who we are. It's like every, everywhere I go, if I have to wear a mask, then I'm going to be mad. And if I have to do this, then I'm going to be mad. And, and if people say something against me, then I'm going to be mad. And, if, and, if, and if, if, if somebody says something I don't agree with on Facebook, you better bet I'm going to sit there and I'm going to type against them. We've become warriors. We would never say the things to people's faces that we say over social media. We would never say some of these things. We'd, we'd be, I'd be afraid of getting punched. Some of the things that I've seen believers say. You know what? If we step outside of our doors and say, I am an ambassador of Jesus Christ, and I have been changed by the power of the gospel, then I am going to be a blessing to someone today. It's not going to be about me. It's not going to be about my comfort. It's going to be about making somebody else feel more comfortable today. Maybe it's about somebody else hearing the truth of the gospel today. So this is Tabitha. Look what she does. She, she, she is rooted in Christ. She is blessing others. We're moving really quickly through this. I tell you what, there's, there's, a, there's a chance that you guys get out of here early today. I don't know what to do. Number three, she lived a life, I'm sorry, a legacy. She left a legacy filled with blessings. Identity rooted in Christ. She had a heart overflowing with compassion. And then this, a legacy filled with blessing. So this story so far, all we've learned is what? In Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha, which is translated Dorcas. She was always doing good works and acts of charity. Great. Fantastic. We can end right there. But her story takes a pretty serious turn here in verse 37. What happens? About that time, she became sick and died. You know, last week when Thomas was preaching, he had Reed lay down on stage and illustrate Ezekiel. So I was talking to Casey and, and Reed over here, and I said, okay, somebody needs to illustrate this morning's, um, this morning's illustration, which is you have to die and come back to life. And so Casey looked at me and said, I'll do it. And I said, no, you actually have to die and come back to life. She's like, I'll do it. How, how do you want to do this? It was awesome. But about that time, she became sick and died. Let's talk about that. Wasn't she doing exactly what she was supposed to be doing? Wasn't she blessing other people? Was she doing anything wrong? That's a trick question. We're all sinners. But, but was her life headed in the right direction? Was she being a blessing? Was she pleasing the Lord? Was she doing what she was supposed to be doing as a disciple? Would, would you have been proud to have her be a member of our church? Then why'd she die? Because we look at this and say, that's not fair. That's not fair. Why would God take her? She has so much left to do. We think about this all the time, especially when I had to preach earlier this year the funeral of an 18-year-old kid. He died in a car accident. You look and say, God, why? He had so much left to do. Tabitha was blessing people. Why would you take him? Because we live in a life, we live in a world that's stained and infected by sin. Death is judgment. But here's the good news behind all this is that when Tabitha closed her eyes here in this place, she opened her eyes in the presence of her Savior. There's good news because death is not the end of the story. Death is the beginning. And if you believe in Jesus as your Savior this morning, then that will be your story. That when you pass out of this earthly life, you'll go into the presence of the Father in heaven. You'll worship Him for all eternity. So, so she died. She, it says in verse 37, about that time, she became sick and died. Here's where it gets weird. Let's walk through this. After washing her, they placed her in a room upstairs. Why is this weird? Let's talk about it. This is weird because Jews typically don't do this. Jewish funerals typically take place almost immediately. 
They, it, there's evidence in this time that they would not let a body rest overnight before it was buried. Their funerals typically happened after burial. And so for them to do this, so they, they did this. Instead of anointing the body with, with oils and spices and putting it in a tomb, they washed it and put it in a room. Why would they put her in a room instead of a tomb? Because they knew her story wasn't over yet. When she passed away, the people around her, the, the, the community of believers around her, they're like, nope, not Tabitha. Not our little gazelle, not Tabitha. She's got too much left to do. And so what do they do? They run to the city of Luda where they know that Peter is. We know Peter. Now, he's never raised anybody from the dead. So they don't know what's going to happen. But their faith wasn't in Peter. It was in Jesus, the one who had died and come back to life. They came to him and they said, since Luda was near, the disciples heard Peter was there, sent two men. Don't delay in coming with us. That's a nice way of saying Stop what you're doing and get over here. And so he ran with them. Verse 39, Peter got up. He went with them. And when he arrived, they led him to the room upstairs. And all the widows approached him, weeping and showing him something. What did they show him? The clothes she had made. This is how she blessed the people. She went to the widow. She went to the people who were poor, the destitute. She went and she made them clothing. She put clothing on their backs. They ran to Peter and they're like, look at the evidence of her life. Look at how she blessed us. Look at the fruit of a life rooted in Christ. I'm going to ask you a really tough question today, all right? If you died today, would anybody outside your immediate circle of a family feel the impact of your absence? I'm not saying would people be sad. I hope everybody would be sad. I hope that we're not the kind of people that people would smile with glee at our funerals, but would anybody feel, have you impacted anybody to this degree? Have you lived your life to be such a blessing that if you left, people would be like, there is a hole in First Baptist Church. There's, there's, there's a gap. We, we can't. We have to have her back. These disciples were so in love with Tabitha. Look what she has done for them. Look at this. is a heart filled with Jesus. She had blessed so many people. They're like, no, we can't do this without her. So they go to Peter and they say, come on, you've got you've to come back with us. Now I say the same, the same question about the church in general. If our church disappeared tomorrow, would our community feel the impact of its absence? I think there's a lot of churches that it wouldn't. They would just keep going on because the church isn't influencing and impacting the community. Let this be a reset for us. Let this be a wake up call. We need to get out of here and start making disciples, start making an impact and being a blessing in the people around us so that if First Baptist Church disappeared tomorrow, the community would say, man, what, what we miss in them. So Peter, look what he does. I love this. Peter sent them all out of the room. He knelt down, he prayed, and turning toward the body, he said, what? Tabitha, get up. Oh, man. She opened her eyes. Now, did Peter know what was about to happen? He couldn't have. He couldn't have known. He had a lot of faith that it would happen, but he looked at that dead body and he said, Tabitha, get up. She opened her eyes. She saw Peter and she sat up. He gave her his hand and helped her to stand up. He called the saints and the widows and presented her alive. Now, we see so many resurrections in the Bible that it, we kind of lose the, the impact of this. But put yourself here in this place. The person you love is gone. You've been at her funeral. You've seen her body. And then all of a sudden, you hear some, some people shout screaming. You go out, you look, and she's standing right there holding hands with Peter. Can you imagine what you would feel like in that moment? What's going on? This is crazy. She's alive. I knew it. I knew she, I thought she was dead. How does this happen? This is a moment, some miraculous thing. I'm sorry, it's scared you. I hope you didn't have any kind of heart palpitations or anything, but think about this moment. This is incredible. This is why they brought Peter. This is why they wanted him there. They believed in the name of Jesus that he could do it because they had seen him do it before. And you know what? This should be very familiar to us because what we see here that happens is almost identical to what happens with Jesus in Mark chapter 5. I want you to go read that later this week. Mark chapter 5. Peter sees Jesus do this exact thing. Jesus clears the room. Jesus takes the hand of the young woman, in this case, the, the daughter of Jairus. He goes and he prays. And he says, 
in, in Hebrew or in Aramaic, he looks at the body, and Jesus does, and says, Talitha kumi, which means little girl, get up. Now, what did Peter say? He said, Tabitha kumi. Tabitha, get up. That's one letter different. What is Peter doing here? He's mimicking his Savior. He, he looked at what Jesus had already done and he's modeling his ministry after what Jesus had already accomplished. He knew the power of Jesus could do this, but he sees all these people then. So what happens though? How does this transform the community? It says here, this became known throughout Joppa. Well, yeah. I mean, that's a, that's a kind of a dumb moment. When you look and say, if, if you knew that somebody in Van had come back from the dead at, at Hilliard Funeral Home, don't you think we would know about it? It would be on Facebook so fast. Sometimes things happen before we, like, something, something could happen and it's like everybody in the community will already know about it before I would even know about it. So we look at everybody in the community to hear about it. This is front, this is front page news. This is headline news. This woman came back from the dead. And how does it impact the community? Many believe. Lord. Let's look at this. So we said number three was a legacy filled with blessing. This is how she blessed the, the community, how she blessed the church. Number one, her gifts blessed the church. We saw this, that she made the clothing, she made all these things, the robes, so that people, the, the poorest people could have. The second thing is her story brought many people to Christ. This story was, was so powerful that it drew many people to Christ. In fact, uh, one commentator said, that the biggest miracle in Acts chapter 9 is not that a woman was raised from the dead, but it's that many people went from death to life. Many people were transformed by the power of the gospel. And then the last thing, this is where I want to end with, her life was a gospel catalyst for the Gentiles. All right, walk with me. Walk with me. Peter, look at verse 43. Peter stayed for some time in Joppa with Simon, a leather tan. Okay, How, what does this matter? Have you ever read verses in scripture and you think like, what, is, what does this have to do with anything? How is this important? Like we've read this huge story, this amazing story, and then Peter, he stayed for some time in Joppa with some guy named Simon. What does this matter? Well, remember I told you she had two names. One name was what? Yeah. Tabitha, and it, its language was Hebrew. And the other name was, I want you to say it, Dorcas, thank you. And that name was Greek. So she had two names because she lived in a city that was on the border between two worlds. The, the world of the Hebrews and the world of the Greeks. So she brought Peter to this city called Joppa. Something else happened in Joppa several hundred years before this. Anybody know? I know you're thinking, you're, you're those, those years are cranking. There was a man named Jonah. You got it. There's a man named Jonah who God had told him, go and preach to the Gentiles. Go to the city of Nineveh. So he went to Joppa. And what did he do at Joppa? He got on a boat. He went in the opposite direction. He's like, no way. I don't want anything to do with the Gentiles. I don't want anything to do with the people out there. So now we see Peter in the same city with the same mission. We're going to see in chapter 10, God is going to send Peter to go and reach the Gentiles. And Peter is going to do what? Say yes. Yes, Lord, I'll do it. He goes and he, and he stays there and he preaches and you see a huge revival starting with Cornelius and his family and then it spreads and thousands upon thousands of people come to faith in Jesus because a woman, a disciple named Tabitha was always doing good works and acts of charity and she died. Her story intersects with the story of Peter. She brings him to where he needs to be so that he could be where he needs to be to be a blessing to everybody else. Listen, right here in this room, we are direct recipients of this blessing. Most of us are not Jews in this room. Most of us don't have any or, or much Jewish ancestry. We're predominantly Gentiles in this place, which means that you and I are direct recipients of that blessing that Peter started here in reaching the Gentiles. Because eventually the gospel spread among the Gentiles into Europe, which eventually would spread into this new world. So you and I right here, Tabitha blessed you. I mean, many, many, many generations come and gone. But she was a blessing to you. She was the catalyst for the gospel reaching the Gentiles. I love the story of Tabitha. I, I, my prayer now is that anytime you hear that name or you see the story in scripture, that you'd be reminded of the blessing that happened here. She's what we should emulate in our lives. She's the believer to emulate. But listen, this is not just a story about teaching us how to be good people. Right? Because what was the first thing we learned about Tabitha? She was a disciple. She, she was rooted in an identity in, in Christ. And so when she closed her eyes in death, 
here and there in verse 37. She opened her eyes in heaven. I think it would be very frustrating to me to go to heaven and then to be called back. I'd be like, dude, why? I was happy, man. I was, I was in the presence of Jesus. Why did you bring me back here? But it's because she had more to do. There was a, a, another mission that God had prepared for her. But listen, that, that, that resurrection was temporary. She was going to live a few more years. And then again, she was going to die an earthly death. And again, she was going to go into the presence of her Savior. This story has a bigger picture behind it because it teaches us that all of us in Christ Jesus will be resurrected. All of us. I love this. Because the thing is, the world is looking for answers right now. They're, they're looking for answers. What happens after death? What happens? What happens? Well, do I just die? Is that it? Is that, is that the end of my story? Is there, do I have to work hard to become a Christian? No. Her works followed her salvation. Remember, she was a disciple, and then she did the works. Works are fruit of roots in Christ. And so this morning, if you trust in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you believe in him and you've given him your life, then the Bible says one day when you pass out of this earthly life, you'll go into our, our home in heaven that he's preparing for us. This is a beautiful picture of what's going to happen to all believers in Christ Jesus. And then one day we'll all gather around the throne of God. People from every tongue, every tribe, every language, every people group, and we will praise and say, worthy is the Lamb who is. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, I'm going to ask you this morning, I'm going to ask our praise team to come and lead us in a song of invitation. I'm going to give you an opportunity. If you don't know Jesus, if you've never made that choice to believe in Jesus as your Savior, I'm going to ask you, just come talk to me. I'm not going to try to sell you anything. I'm not going to try to get you to sign up for anything. I want you to know what's going to happen on the other end of this earthly life. I want you to have confidence that we can't save ourselves. Our good works can't save ourselves. But Jesus did the work that was required when he died on the cross, shed his blood. He was the sacrifice that we needed to atone for our sins. And now he offers you redemption, forgiveness, because of what he did for you. If you just reach out to him. So if that's you this morning, if you want to make a decision for Christ, you want to choose Jesus this morning, please come and talk to me. If you want to join the church, this is also an opportunity. If you need to pray, the altars will be open. I'd love to pray with you. But this is your moment of, of opportunity. Father, I thank you for this time that we've had. I thank you for the story of Tabitha. What a beautiful story that teaches us, Lord, that in you, death is not the end. It's the beginning. It's the beginning of, a, of, of, of the next chapter, the eternal chapter of our lives when we are in the presence of, of Jehovah, the presence of our Savior, Jesus. I thank you for everybody in here, and I pray that if somebody in this room is experiencing doubts, they don't know if they're saved right now. I pray that you would, you would do what you only can do. I, I, I cannot convince anyone to be saved. That's not my job. My job is to proclaim the gospel and let the Holy Spirit do the work of convicting, convincing, and regenerating. And I pray that you would do that this morning if somebody doesn't know you as their Savior. Father, move among our people. In the name of Jesus, we ask these things. Amen. All right, good morning. Thank you all so much for joining us this morning. It's been such an awesome pleasure to have you all here this morning and have Sunday school back as well. Uh, we had a great time over in the youth room. It was really a lot of fun. But I have some announcements for us. If you are a visitor, there's a visitor card on the front of the pew, or on the pew in front of you. So grab one of those, fill it out. We'd love to get in touch with you sometimes this week just to learn some about you. Um, Anyone who came out to the work day yesterday, we are so thankful for you. We got a lot of work done around the church. It really looks great. Uh, thank you, Larry, for putting all that together and just everyone who came out and served for that. Uh, this is a reminder for the ladies' Bible study that is starting this Wednesday night. If you are interested in joining that, uh, talk to Mindy over here. She'd love to tell you more about that and what that's going to look like. And uh, I believe we're still taking book orders, so if you want a book for that, let us know today, and we can make sure to get you one for that. Um, this Thursday night, this is for the youth, we are having a girls' pool party and a guys' pool party. The uh, girls' pool party will be at the Johnson's and the guys will be at the Admires. If you want any more information on that, just uh, send us a message or come talk to us after. We'll get that to you. Um, it'll be a lot of fun. We'll have, obviously, a pool, spike ball, that sort of stuff. So it'll be a lot of fun. Um, and then next Sunday, we're going to have parent meetings for camp. Uh, we're going to have two separate meetings. Uh, they'll both cover the same exact things, one after church and then one at 4 o'clock uh, next Sunday. 
Um, so just giving y'all two opportunities to come to that. Uh, it'll be short, brief. We'll uh, make sure y'all are out of here at a pretty reasonable time to make sure you can get to lunch still. But um, so that, and then there's also still spots for camp, and we have extended the discount for a little bit longer for a few more spots. So if you haven't signed up for camp, make sure you get signed up. It's uh, discounted to $75 right now. It's going to be a lot of fun. And uh, just don't forget the parent meeting next week. And I believe that is all of our announcements. Again, we're so thankful for you all, the time that you all spent with us this morning. And here's Barry. All right, thank you. I had the pleasure of working with uh, Thomas yesterday. He got demoted to my group. And uh, we were hauling limbs. And stuff had a good time. I almost lost an eye and killed somebody. But we all survived. It was all good. Uh, let's stand and be dismissed today. I love the devil.